Very good morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. You're joining us with us on this bright Sunday morning with another very special session on continuous professional development organized by the collaboration of the Society of Health Research and Innovations and Government Medical Officers Association. Before I introduce the topic for today's session, I would like to kindly draw your attention to the ground rules of the webinar. On common courtesy to the lecturer and for uninterrupted sessions, you'll be kindly noted that your access to audio and visuals have been terminated and you're expected to keep your mic at mute mode at all times. As you know, the webinar has been open for the participants from 9 a.m. and you're free to join in until 9.45 a.m. and no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. However, as there's another parallel session being convinced on the efficiency bar examination revisions, the participants of this session have been limited to 100. However, please know that you are free to join in with us on the YouTube live streaming of this session, and the link for the live streaming will, be, will appear on the chat in a while. And please feel free to post any questions that you have on the session at the chat box. And each attendee should have been attended to till the end of the webinar to obtain the certificates for continuing professional development points. And these continuing professional development points strictly adhered to the National Committee for the Continuing Professional Development Guidelines. And this is done to improve and maintain the standards of the CPD programs conducted by SHRI and GMOA. So thanking advance for your strict adherence to the CPD regulations and uh, expecting your kind compliance, I would like to introduce about the today's webinar. So the today's webinar will be focused on prevention and control of leptospirosis, which is a zoonotic infectious disease, which is deadly, but preventable. So this session will be followed with another lecture on the clinical management of leptospirosis, uh, which is scheduled on the 6th of November. So in order to identify the disease patterns of this uh, crucial is, uh, of this disease, it's very crucial to any professional in medicine. And in order to have a clear understanding about the prevalence, the epidemiological patterns, and the measures of prevention of this infectious disease. And also to reduce the disease burden of the health sector, uh, we would have this session on the topic of the prevention and control of leptospirosis. And joining with us today for this special, as a, our distinguished guest, is a professional with vast experience and knowledge on prevention of epidemiological diseases and non-communicable -commun diseases such as leptospirosis. Is joining with us today is Dr. Kashani Dabrera. Uh, Dr. Kashani is. Um, has been working as a regional epidemiologist and also a consultant community physician at district level on prevention of uh, communicable diseases. And she's currently working as a consultant community physician at Epidemiology Unit, Ministry of Health, and is also the focal point of leptospirosis prevention, com, uh, le leptospirosis prevention of the Ministry of uh, Health in Sri Lanka. Uh, so now I would like to cordially invite Dr. Tushani Dabrera. The floor is yours, madam. Good morning. Thank you, Tatsara, for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you for uh, all for providing me with the platform to share uh, some updates regarding these important details. I will share this. Okay. Good, good morning, everyone. As Dr. Tassa mentioned, I'm Dr. Tushani. I'm the uh, focal point for leptospirosis prevention and control program at the epidemiology unit in Sri Lanka. And we, we, we will be talking about this neglected tropical disease, neglected throughout the world and 
neglected in Sri Lanka in all aspects as well. Uh, so uh, let me start off by saying leptospirosis is actually a disease that is highly underestimated in numbers. It is true for the, through the, throughout the world as well as in Sri Lanka. And uh, if I say that we have about 40,000 dengue cases in Sri Lanka, most of you will be say, okay, it is so because you have been hearing about it in the media, during your clinical uh, uh, sessions. But uh, if I ask anyone in Sri Lanka, how many leptospirosis cases has been reported throughout the years for the surveillance and prevention and control, uh, it is actually many wouldn't know. So it is a timely topic. And I thank the GMOA and the Sri for giving me this opportunity to talk to a vast uh, majority of our members. So uh, as uh, stated earlier, leptospirosis is an infectious disease, infectious and a communicable disease. So I hope that we all know the difference between this, whether, so whether it is an infectious or a communicable disease, because infectious disease, uh, Okay, let's say all communicable diseases are infectious, but not all infectious diseases are communicable. So communicable diseases, there, there is a pathway where we, uh, like the disease get communicated to a person or an animal through some sort of a medium of water, food, uh, vectors, and so on. But there are other infectious diseases which are not actually communicable. So this is actually a uh, communicable and an infectious disease caused by the bacteria called leptospirospires and uh, they have several serotypes and uh, it is a highly motile aerobic uh, spirochete. So uh, you will remember from your microbiology days uh, what kind of a bacteria it's that. And it is actually maintained in the kidneys of animals. Uh, so um, like rats, rodents, and dogs, and some other wild mammals, it is uh, actually a sort of a, a disease uh, that the uh, agent is everywhere in the environment. And then uh, through these uh, animals, this uh, bacteria gets into contact with the humans uh, by um, either directly or indirectly. And this is also called a zoonotic, a zoonotic disease because of this mechanism. And there are more than 200 serovars of the uh, bacteria that is called uh, leptospiro interferons. There are very, uh, there are some more uh, species but uh, we actually in Sri Lanka, uh, our uh, main bacteria, the bacteria responsible for the, uh, the species responsible for leptospirosis, we know as leptospiro integra. And uh, in Sri Lanka, the reservoir hosts are the rats, rodents, cattle, dogs, and pigs. And there may be several more. Uh, so uh, this is, through the environment, through the animal host, that we get this disease. Actually, we are accidental, accidental hosts. We are just on the way, like we are uh, between the environment and the animal, and we get accidentally inject, infected. It is unlike dengue or malaria, where the dengue mosquito has to have the human blood to uh, lay the eggs, or where the malaria parasite has to complete the life cycle within the humans. So bacteria, this uh, leptospiro uh, bacteria doesn't need the human host to survive, but we, we usually get in the way of the bacteria and we get infected. And this route is through the water or soil. So this, uh, when the animals who have the bacteria in their kidneys, 
they pass the bacteria to the water or soil through their urine and the bacteria enters our body through abrasions of our skin wounds on our skin or through the mucous membranes it is either from the nasal oral or eye mucous membranes and sometimes ingestion of contaminated water it is through the membranes and after infection they enter the blood and can invade practically all tissues all uh, all the uh, organs and can be deadly for some uh, so this is how we get the disease either you get through the contaminated water and soil and through the membranes so when you actually ingest water in a uh, from a contaminated water source uh, near the paddy field or near your house you may get uh, leptospirosis so it is very important to educate the people that you should not drink from unprotected sources and if you talk about the epidemiology uh, this this is occurs worldwide but very very common in tropical and subtropical areas like in our countries and as i said incidence is underestimated uh, and we have to imagine the numbers because this is not diagnosed and it is actually neglected in the sense that we don't get the lab uh, data and we don't do enough research and no uh, data is available regarding this uh, important disease uh, because the surveillance system may not capture the all the data available and uh, globally uh, we have seen uh, like in any other disease there are several researchers but if you search up uh, the uh, popular sites you won't find many uh, actually many studies regarding leptospirosis very uh, limited uh, unlike dengue or any other popular disease this is again neglected in the research side as well but the research that has been conducted uh, so they have done a, a systematic review and uh, they have identified the disease incidence is grossly underestimated and uh they have estimated annually there will be about 1 million cases worldwide and 58000 deaths due to leptospirosis alone so we don't get that much from our surveillance data and the uh, from the uh, review they say that the large proportion of cases are uh, estimated to occur in adult males and within the range of 20 to 49 years and we can see the observation in our uh, data as well in sri lanka and again the highest estimates are from the southeast asia caribbean and the other tropical countries and again we see that it is among the leading zoonotic causes of morbidity and again mortality may be more than the other hemorrhagic fevers right but and the highest morbidity and the mortality is estimated to occur in resource poor countries because uh, again it is common in those countries and the resources are poor so uh, again uh, at that uh, instance the burden is underappreciated underestimated and we don't know exactly what we are dealing with and in sri lanka again there's a dearth of uh, scientific literature but the rajarata university leads the way in doing leptospirosis research and they have done a systematic review in sri lanka and they have uh, actually accessed all the available uh, sources and our own uh, surveillance data from the quarterly epidemiology bulletins and uh, other immr data so they have found like 42 relevant full texts 
32 quarterly epidemiological bulletins and eight tight IMMRs. They were included in the review and they found the estimated annual case load from 2000 to 2015 was 10,000, nearly 10,000 cases. And uh, actually speaking, we can see later whether we are getting the correct picture or maybe it could be more. And the annual deaths could be seven, around uh, estimated to be around 730. Those are estimates from the review and uh, not the data that we receive. So, but we have to understand there is a discrepancy between the estimated numbers and the uh, data that we receive. And uh, from that uh, review also, they have found that the most common organs involved were the kidneys, liver, and heart. So uh, actually in Sri Lanka, so this is what is happening, but now we are seeing a different, uh, uh, different uh, picture. So we need more research to find out what is happening. Uh, this, uh, when it comes to underestimation and underreporting, uh, there are several reasons for this. Uh, nobody is suspicious. Nobody is aware when a per person is presenting with fever. Uh, nowadays, people will probably think about dengue, maybe COVID earlier, and um, viral fever, or any other illness other than leptospirosis. That's one reason. And so they will be treated and sent home and uh, the leptospirosis will go undetected. And unlike dengue and other diseases, uh, we don't have actually a good diagnostic capacity uh, as in any other country. We don't have a good diet. So we, if we need to test for leptospirosis, either you have some, some lab, uh, laboratories in the universities or even in the hospital where you can do the uh, ELISA, but mainly you have to depend on our central system where the MRI does the MAT. But uh, uh, we, we don't have widespread uh, lab testing capacity. So this is again, uh, unlike dengue, so where you have the NS1 and you know uh, the, whether it is dengue from day one, uh, this is not so. And commonly, people get uh, actually uh, leprospirosis and uh, you don't have any symptoms or that those symptoms are negligible. Uh, you may have got some uh, sort of a headache and all that and the zero conversion just goes unnoticed. And we don't have a, we don't do screening tests, and uh, you don't know what is happening. And even when symptomatic, majority of them will manifest as just a uh, viral syndrome, undifferentiated febrile illness, just fever, body aches, and you either think it is dengue and test, and uh, and then they will get better, or you treat with antibiotics uh, when you, the person goes to a, a GP and the pe uh, person is okay. Just like 5 to 10% of the noticed infections go on to severe disease and death. But when it becomes severe, there is a high possibility of uh, fatality if you don't uh, diagnose and treat. And again, this is uh, really uh, unfortunate that leptospirosis is seen among our, uh, let's not say neglected, but among a population where it is not fashionable to get the disease, like in dengue. So uh, I, I should not say fashionable, but you know, there is a certain, uh, the urban and the other parts of the country uh, where you get fever and oh, you say oh, it's dengue. But in, the, uh, in this uh, regard, leptospirosis is found among the people who give uh, food, who provide food to our country, who work and who work uh, actually really hard and they may neglect their own health. 
sometimes, but they may go to uh, doctors, the GPs, and the, if we don't, uh, we are the, uh, the medical staff and the health staff, they may go undetected. And this young productive male will get severe disease and will die if we don't treat promptly. And if you talk about the epidemiology in Sri Lanka, it is uh, reported throughout the year, not just when we talk about uh, monsoons and rains, but it is from January to December we get cases. But we see uh, an increase during the harvesting season between March and May, which coincides with our monsoons. And there is a large one during October to uh, from September up to October, December. And these seasonal variabilities where we should take into consideration when planning the prevention and control activities. And I will say, tell you why. Because even though it is reported throughout the year, it is very difficult to carry out a control program uh, throughout the year in, uh, with regard to a disease like this. We will see what. So we will see the uh, data, as I said, severe underreporting is there. This is what we get from the hospitals. So more, all of you will be remembering our notification form. Uh, so you all may have a field, at least one leptospirosis uh, uh, patient information on this H544. Uh, and if you have not, please, do so in the future and don't leave it to the ICNO. If you diagnose, if you suspect leptospirosis, please notify because your data is this. The, you, you during 2020, even during the COVID pandemic, 2021, you have sat down and written 8,579 notifications. So even during that time, you have written and 2021, 6,928. Again, this is the number where you get when the patient is admitted to the hospital, not when the patient is having fever and headache and body aches and he goes to a GP and uh, gets a treatment for, let's say, my brush it off as viral uh, fever or any maybe dengue, whatever. But this is not the cases. Those are actually the people who are admitted. So they get some sort of severe illness where they need to get admitted. They feel that they have to get admitted. So nearly 9,000 people in 2020 has got admitted and got treated and survived, okay? And in 2020, 6,000, but again, I checked the IMMR, grossly underreported. Uh, you'll be shocked to know how many have been uh, diagnosed, maybe clinically, maybe on suspicion, not, not certainly not as a lab diagnose, but sus on suspicion, uh, here they have uh, notified 6,000, but nearly 20,000, or maybe it is because if there is fever, uh, if you just write the diagnosis as uh, leptospirosis, then um, the medical records officer will uh, enter it as leptospirosis. But again, these are actually the numbers that you have written and you have on suspicion, that's great. So even during 2020, when we have forgotten all the diseases, uh, you all have uh, actually notified leptospirosis. So we are grateful for that. Otherwise, we don't, we will not, we, without your numbers, without your notifications, we won't have any of those data to even to just to say, okay, it is rising or decreasing or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so far this year, in 2022, we have got about 3,600 cases notified. Again, as I said, it could be more. So the incident rate, 
per 100,000 population, you see there is an increase. And we are really worried about the coming years, coming months, and this year, specifically because many people will be uh, like uh, getting into the agriculture activities. And we have to be very, very vigilant. We have to be very suspicious when a person comes with leptospirosis, you never know. So it won't be the traditional farmer who will come with the fever, but it could be a doctor, it could be a engineer, an engineer, another teacher, or maybe even a school child. So you have to have a high amount of suspicion. And the district level data, uh, as I said, we find the uh, persons who are getting infected they are from several districts and may all are, again, as I said, under reporting. So the, those are the cumulative effects we get as the national data. From Ratnapura, this year, we got the highest number of cases in Kegol, Gol, Kalutra. But as you see, you get from all the uh, districts, at least one or two or 10. So you see this is a widespread disease in Sri Lanka. May, may, the pattern may change if you don't. Uh, see, suspect, treat, and notify. So we have to be very, very vigilant. And again, you can see when Colombo, we get urban, uh, I mean, in the urban areas as well as the agricultural areas. So those uh, districts are also at risk. This pattern will change. Like in some uh, years, it could be Kego, some years it could be Ratnura or Kurnagala, Anuradhapura. It depends on the rainfall pattern and uh, but not. But this is usually the pattern that we see. And the trend. So, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, this is actually not very clear. The, this is the black line is the 2020 line. Uh, in the uh, 20, uh, so 2022 line, 2020 is the green line. So you see a sort of a, a different pattern from the other uh, years. You see a peak uh, during uh, May to June, July. Uh, there's a reason and you see how important your data is. So you see the pattern and we can, we have to infer what has happened. In 2020, there was a lockdown. People cannot get out of the house. Then what they did was they, when they went out of the house uh, and started agriculture work. So most of the unimmunized people, not the farmers, they got leptospirosis late in the year, uh, not like the uh, earlier uh, years. And so this, your data, we can see what is happening. So this year also, we were really worried that we may see the trend again, but uh, we don't know. But you see in September, uh, this is not a downward trend because we don't get the notification. Um, uh, we get the weekly notification, so it will be different. So we can we may see this uh, increase uh, in September, October, November, December, although we try hard to stop it through several activities. We will be talking about those later. And the deaths. So uh, as I said, nobody cares. Uh, we, we, we will always talk about uh, dengue, 40,000 cases, 24 deaths or something like that. But lepto, it is more than that. Sometimes there are about 200 deaths, 2020, 20, 21, um, and uh, nearly 100 deaths. Up to now, we have got about 50 deaths reported uh, so what I get as data, I, I compile and I say it is 50, but maybe more, maybe less. We don't know because uh, due to some uh, reasons, uh, we have to uh, actually confirm the dates uh, properly. Uh, there are mechanisms which we are, because of the COVID situation, we are not doing at the moment. And uh, the dates reflect the disease pattern as well more males, more fem uh, less females, and the age group you see from 20 to 50, uh, 60 years, the young productive males are getting uh, the disease and die. So this, is, this also reflects the current uh, uh, data that we see. 
and uh, the uh, deaths by district. So if you all are working in those districts, be, please be aware. But again, as I said, in uh, there are uh, other districts coming up because sometimes if you do, yeah, if you are not very familiar with the disease, uh, you may not know about this. But in Ratnapura, Matara, Gol, Hambantota, uh, and even in other uh, Anuradhapura, maybe there are deaths, but the notified deaths are uh, we have like the forty deaths that I mentioned earlier, not the fifty. The fifty I have not uh, analyzed, but just 10, but here uh, we can see Ratnapura tops the list because you see the number is increased, the notified number is increased. And again, when you have outbreaks like that, the death rate also goes up. And you see the uh, actually the uh, relationship between the uh, number of cases and the deaths. So it is true for any communicable disease. You have an in increase in incidence either dengue or COVID, and you have the death rates up. You see the death rates increasing. And uh, we see like uh, January, when the cases are about 500, the number is five. But when the caseload increases, the deaths also get increased because there are reasons, because we are actually, uh, not because uh, we have uh, we do not diagnose or even suspect or even, but resource-wise, we may be very, um, like, uh, we will be compromised. When we have increased number of patients, it is very difficult for the hospitals to cope up with that. So it is actually really important to prevent these type of uh, infections, dengue, lepto, to stop, actually the stop the deaths Re, uh, like reduce the deaths, you have to reduce the numbers. So uh, there are uh, our surveillance system, we have the routine surveillance and we have the special uh, uh, surveillance system from the field where the notified case gets investigated by the PHI and he has to send a special investigation form if the P, uh, PHI confirms that this is uh, lepto. Sometimes the notifications comes as uh, lepto, but uh, uh, afterwards when they uh, like, you know, uh, diagnose and they get the results, it is not lepto, it could be dengue. So when the patient is discharged, he is sent home with a diagnosis card saying it is dengue. So the, then the PHI is not confirming as lepto and then he won't fill a special form, but the if the hospital says this is lepto and he, the diagnosis card says this is lepto, then he confers it and he, then he gets all the details of those confirmed patients and send it to the APD unit. So you see it's a very, I mean, uh, let's say a cumbersome process of surveillance, but which is really good because we at least we have the data and so you see for 3,000 odd cases that have been notified nearly about, let's say confirmed, it could be 90% uh, or 60%. So we, we have to get the special investigations forms for those uh, people. So I have analyzed the special investigation forms for about 300 odd uh, uh, cases just to get an idea to see what is uh, happening in our country, whether it is compatible with the uh, scenario in other countries. And uh, again, from the special investigation forms, we see uh, that the males are more. And again, we see that we, the trend is there are people between 20 to 60 age groups who are getting affected. But we see a worrying trend where we see the young from zero to 19, not the zero, but you may get eight, eight year old child, 12 year old child. So we see a rising trend. So even in the districts um, where we had the district reviews, they are very worried that see, they see some children with uh, leptospirosis. So if there is an increase in incidence among them, we, we like uh, 
we might have to you be very careful because with the fatality associated. So it's very, very dangerous. So you have to prevent the leptospirosis infection among the children. And if they get the infection, we have to detect and treat as soon as possible. And occupation-wise in Sri Lanka, as I said, this is an occupational hazard for the farmers. Uh, most of the, uh, actually the uh, cases were among the farmers, but uh, there are uh, like, you know, numbers, 50-50. There are people who are unemployed in the sense they may be housewives or the other, um, because whatever the PHI says unemployed, we have to take as un unemployed but she may be a housewife. And if they say uh, laborer like that, we take it. So you see, apart from the farmers, there are several uh, actually uh, uh, other categories who are at risk. So among them, you see, uh, some people may have gone to the paddy field just for fun, maybe to send kites, maybe to play, maybe to play cricket, we don't know. And, uh, but uh, th there is a column for other remarks. Sometimes they say, okay, they have played Omashi land. So likewise, and Kira Kotu, Kohila Kotu, they, they would be there. And there are laborers. So again, you see, there are students, very worrying trend. So they may be going to the paddy field as part of their employment because of the school closures and they may be playing. So we have to be very careful and aware of the students regarding this. And you see the housewives. So they are not the regular farmers, but they may go to the paddy field or they may go to the Kohila Kotu, Kira Kotu and they get the And we see the, among these 350, you see, uh, just 300, so we don't know that there are gem miners from Ratnapur. So when we see those data, we have to think of the control system because we will be targeting the high risk group and we will be doing whatever the activities among the high risk group thinking this is the high risk group or, because that's a cost effective method because you this, this is a disease that we'll discuss it later. We can only control at the moment. So we control from the highest risk group from any means, but we have to understand the data behind those. Right? And the symptoms and signs, major symptoms uh, from our uh, uh, surveillance data, it's fever. And 90% of them got headache, myalgia, and conjunct redness. So you see the, these um, symptoms are non-specific and people may miss the diagnosis. And you see the cough is also there among 7%. So it could be like we will like confuse it with COVID as well. And as I said, high risk occupations or groups the farmers, the gem miners, sand miners are there, and people affected, so the people who are involved in the rescue operations, and sewer workers among the urban uh, areas, and the people who do their fishing, like uh, there are small uh, waters, like ponds associated with the paddy fields, so where they go and uh, fish for inland fish, they are at risk, we see, and we can't uh, do anything to them beforehand other than educating. And those people who uh, are like at risk, the people who go and pluck the kohila and kira, so they are more at risk because the kohila has thorns and you can get abrasions. Uh, so we have seen many cases, the housewives, and other people who got leptospirosis due to this. And uh, uh, water, small uh, waterlogged areas like this, and the, the children who play in the paddy fields, and uh, they are at risk. And uh, there are several 
reports earlier in 2015 or yeah, even earlier, where people uh, who were having uh, these uh, recreational activities like white water rafting in Kutkitulgala, they had a small outbreak and uh, veterinary uh, people and associated people who are working with cattle and other uh, farming activities, they are also at risk. Uh, we'll, uh, so this is the, the epidemiological data. So you understand because uh, it is the degree of suspicion usually matters in leptospirosis. So those data, they are really, really important when you uh, see a patient with pain. Where he's from, his occupation, other risk factors. So it is actually very important that you know about those. And um, the incubation period is usually, as usual, it is five to 14 days and it may rain. And uh, the clinical features, as we said, it is like, uh, like any other illness. Uh, majority get fever and redness of eyes, severe body aches. Some of them get jaundice and some get productive cough and nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. And um, maybe reduce urine output. But the case fatality, as you saw from the data, it could be very low from 5%, maybe it can rise up to 30% sometimes. And important uh, causes of death in literature include renal failure, heart failure, and hemorrhage. But in Sri Lanka, we are analyzing the death and we see that the pulmonary complications and uh, maybe myocarditis, myocardial uh, in, uh, involvement, uh, there is a uh, risk. So we have to have our own data uh, other than the uh, international data. So in international data, they have also said the pulmonary involvement is there and in the, 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 uh, uh, the review. One uh, research has shown if the, uh, the pulmonary uh, involvement is there and the central nervous uh, system is involved, there is a high risk for death. And the diagnosis is through, uh, still, it is through the detection of antibodies. So you all know antibodies are positive. You, can, you have to see the rise in theta after five days of infection. So this is, um, we can't wait for five days after the patient develops sim uh, symptoms because uh, we have to promptly treat because this is preventable. So that's why we need to know the local epidemiology and we have to be suspicious and uh, think, okay, if there is an occupational or on any other recreational exposure, this could be leptospirosis. Never wait for the lab confirmation. So uh, most of the time, uh, if you start the antibiotics early, the patient will be saved. And there are other tests. I won't be talking about those because you have a, a, a good uh, a clinical lecture later on. So we will just uh, go through those. And the differential diagnosis can include the on, not only those. There are so many uh, differential diagnoses. So in Sri Lanka, this could be uh, any other thing. So always have a suspicion, always go for the um, uh, occupational and the recreational history, otherwise you will miss the diagnosis. So uh, the types of uh, lab diagnosis, there are indirect and direct, the most common and usually the um, gold standard is actually the uh, microscopic agglutination test or the MAT. And the ELISA is there, but uh, nowadays with the availability of PCR machines, if the economy improves, we have to think of the PCR as well. Earlier, it was really, really expensive, very difficult. But uh, if there is PCR machines available, uh, we may have to think of the date. So it will be like, you know, at least the severe cases we can detect, but still, uh, I'm not 
I don't think with the current economic situation, we can do that. Uh, uh, there are some uh, universities, the Rajarata and Karapitya, they, are, they, they do the PCR, so we can get the help of uh, the, those uh, uh, hospitals. Um, but usually we have to send for the MRI, for the MAT test. And uh, there is a sort of a advantages and disadvantages. So what we do is we do the MAT test, PCR in selected like universities, two or three universities. And uh, ELISA is also sometimes, but I don't know whether some reagents are available. And uh, okay. I don't think we need to go for those. And the treatment is, again, it is a treatable disease. And treatment should be initiated as soon as the disease is suspected. And should not wait for the lab results. And there are other supportive measures that you can take. Very difficult to treat when once it is severe, not difficult because we don't have enough resources. And Okay, this is the most important uh, part, prevention. We have prevention strategies for many communicable diseases. So it, there are uh, like taking into consideration, we just don't say, okay, we are going to eliminate leptospirosis. We are going to eradicate leptospirosis. We are, we are saying we are going to eradicate polio. We have eradicated polio, measles. Uh, we are going to eradicate measles, right? Rubella. But we are not going to say just now, we are going to, we are not going to, we actually, we are not trying to eliminate or eradicate leptospirosis. We can only control why. It is because this is a disease. The, the, the bacteria is all over the environment, among the, uh, actually, among the, uh, many reservoirs, maybe rats, rodents, any other uh, res uh, animal reservoir, cattle, and it is in the environment, in the soil and in the water base. So it is very, very, I mean, if you want to eliminate, you may have to kill off all the animals associated with the uh, disease. And the environment, you have to purify the soil. But you can't do that. So there are diseases that can be eliminated or eradicated. Smallpox we eradicated because we don't know. There, there were no, actually, no uh, animal uh, host among the, uh, like, um, for the uh, smallpox. And there is a very effective vaccine. But here we do, we have a lot of animal uh, Host, we, they tease in the environment, so it is very difficult. So it is like tetanus. So you can't uh, uh, eliminate tetanus, or you can eliminate uh, because you uh, through vaccination, but you can't uh, take off the bacteria from the environment, it, like diphtheria. So you can just eliminate it as a public health problem if you have a proper vaccine or if you have proper treatment. Uh, in the leptospirosis, we don't have a good vaccine. We don't have any like sort of treatment. We only have the prophylaxis. So we will be talking about very limited uh, use also. So we will be controlling. So again, with the resources we have, from where can we control? So I showed you our uh, pattern. So it is during the uh, those months that we get the highest number of cases, two times during the year. So the deaths also uh, get increased during those times. So we will be targeting the control programs during those times. Ideally, it should be throughout the year, but due to resource issues, and practical and cost effective, what we should do is we should target the activities during those times. And uh, when we take those factors, 
we have to we see from the data that the farmers are affected and there are other groups so we have to raise the uh, awareness among the farmers and among the uh, other population so the gem miners we get the data okay they are at risk so we have to tell them you may be at risk of developing leptospirosis throughout the year not just during the harvesting like in the farmers but during uh, throughout the year but but we have what we have to do is we have to make them aware if you get the fever please tell the doctor that you are a gem miner that you are a, a person who is at risk and the doctor also should be aware that okay this could be leptospirosis so the healthcare providers must also be made aware so this is part of our awareness program and the general population is should be also aware because otherwise they will think this is covid this is dengue but not lepto if they get fever after floods or after they work in the paddy fields and the literature says we won't be having a, a vaccine for another 50, 10 to 15 years that's the only uh, only way of uh, control uh, eliminating this leptospirosis we need to do this because the we see that the disease is killing off the young people fatal disease for some and even can you imagine like 6000 20000 in the hospital it's very I mean, during the harvesting season, if there are about uh, there, there are 10, 20 in one ward, then it will suddenly 40, 50, and you get dengue. I mean, this is a tropical country who get many uh, communicable diseases. So it's very difficult. So we, we need to control it somehow, and we need to find uh, a vaccine soon. Uh, but there are like in Cuba, they have tested out vaccine, but it is very difficult, you know, if you start, uh, you have to, uh, like in COVID, uh, the platform is there, recombinant technique is there, uh, so they are researching. And again, there is need for more research into the basic microbiology. So see, this is, this is even the basic microbiology of the bacteria, we have to do more research. So, uh, like uh, lepto, very we have a high incidence, so at least the clinical and the other aspects we need to research more to give out data to develop uh, actually a vaccine, effective vaccine. So as I said, the prevention and control should be targeted at the infection source. So where is the source? Either it's a paddy field, marshy land, gem uh, mine, or uh, the water source, Kira Kotu. Uh, and we have to prevent and control at that site. And the route of transmission between the infection source and the human host. So what is the route? Either through the water or soil, through abraded skin. And the infection these or disease in the human host. So how can we prevent that? So we have to check on that. There are general prevention measures. Waste management is one. So as I said, our number one uh, animal host is the rat. So the rat, we can actually, if you do waste management properly, there are many, many communicable diseases that we can prevent. Lepto is one. Rabies is another typhoid, uh, the flies and fly diarrheal diseases, dengue, most of the uh, diseases could be prevented if you do have a good waste management system. And those are general preventive measures and um, sometimes not practical. And uh, to wear protective clothing while you are doing the harvesting, paddy uh, harvesting and all, which is not very, very feasible in our country, but in some countries they do that. And uh, don't use unprotected water sources for drinking. Avoid walking in flood water, which is again impractical to say in our this thing and doxy prophylaxis, we'll be talking about it. And we have to aware the, as I said, again, the public and the high risk groups through media, social media, through the health sector. And we have to aware and train our health staff and 
doxy prophylaxis health education intersectoral collaboration so for the past three two to three, three years because of covid all these activities were like you know severely hampered so and with the economic issues also with the this year also we, it was very difficult to get into the field but we need to talk about this we, we have been doing this for the past so many years but we have to start again so at least the baseline data is there so we have to talk so prophylaxis is for the high risk groups for the farmers for the people who are affected by floods or associated with the uh, flood relief and this doxycycline is 200 mg weekly uh, for let's say six weeks until the farming uh, activities are completed so you start one week before you start this farming activities and you can uh, have it until you finish so this is for the specific high risk group so it is very easy to uh, not easy in the sense but there is a known group we can target and reduce the numbers and uh, it should be taken with or without food under a medical doctors either moh or moa or a medical officer should prescribe it and uh, we we have actually uh, distributed through the phis uh, under the supervision of moh and there are contract so uh, you see with the number of children getting affected we can't give uh, if the children are below 12 years and if it, you are pregnant and lactating mothers and if there is allergy so it's a problem so we people are asking what about the children what can we give we can't give what we can do is ask them to not to go to the paddy field if they have wounds and even if they go to the paddy field to wear protective clothing and even then which is very impractical uh, if they go to the, this thing paddy field and play or they are, they went to a marshy land or kohila kira kotwa they we have to make them aware if we get fever tell it to the doctor and the doctor should also think about leptospirosis so this is awareness at both ends so we, that's how we should manage it and during floods and landslides also we give prophylaxis for the affected and the prophylaxis for rescue personnel because uh, they are at risk so we usually do that and our main prevention strategy is surveillance without your data we don't know whether we are having lepto outbreak or even with the, whether we are having outbreaks or not surveillance is the key to diseases like uh, lepto dengue or any other communicable disease and until we get a good uh, like until we eradicate now see monkeypox came back uh, now as uh, we eradicated smallpox but the uh, there was an animal host for monkeypox so the those diseases keep cropping up and if there is no surveillance system it is really really dangerous so your surveillance system you what you initiate at the hospitals we get the data and we can proceed so we have the routine and we have a special surveillance system we had a special surveillance system in the hospitals earlier but it is not there anymore but we have a special surveillance system from the uh, field where the phi looks into the uh, individual case base and file as i showed you earlier and notification is mandatory i don't need to uh, reiterate this again and again notification is mandatory for the notifiable disease you can be jailed if you don't notify jail for 6 months or face a fine of 1000 rupees which was imposed like 100 years back so it was not uh, like uh, change but I mean, so that's how important it is. Notification is mandatory. What is notifiable? So a suspected leptospirosis patient. So you don't need to 
some are in uh, like uh, they have this uh, uh, misconception that if it is only lab confirmed or it is confirmed that they have to know if you suspect please notify nobody it is through the five h544 through to the moh and the moh investigates and the field investigation is there and they take the activity uh, prevention activities and they send it for the national level and the district level for compilation so this is uh, the most important thing this is where we see okay there is a problem and we need to attend if you don't uh, notify the suspected leprosy uh, it is going to be a really big problem it's not the duty of the icn no it is your duty your duty to who see the patient to sit down and write the h544 there may be other i mean the uh, you can just sign it it's okay but you have to have the understanding that it is your duty it's not the icn no duty and it is like uh, when i uh, because i have been working in the field uh, i know that the uh, you know the in the curative sector uh, the doctors think even if you don't if you notify there's nothing happening no whatever you notify each each and every notification card it 544 the phi has to be like you know he has to enter it to the notification register and go and you know uh, investigate it and come back and report and in the, so you see all these like for this year 3000 odd how many 3000 odd leprosyrus cases you have notified and the phi uh, somehow or other where if there is no economic or any other issue he would have he gone and see in the patient and done some activities so even before covid it was like that so the phi has to do likewise do it so if he doesn't do it there will be more cases coming so it's a sort of a vicious cycle if you don't do it otherwise the cases will be coming and you will you if you don't notify there will be a problem at least if you notify one case two or three cases will be prevented so as i said it is very difficult to uh, actually uh, control this type of uh, diseases without the uh, resources so human resource wise so imagine 1000 uh, not phis in sri lanka around 1500 let's say 2000 at maximum which is not the, even that looking into 40000 cases of dengue looking into 3000 cases of leptospirosis maybe some other illnesses so the, even at the preventive sector lack, lack of resources and again when you overcrowd the hospitals there's going to be a problem so your notification is the key if you notify the first case first index case index case outbreaks can be prevented it is true for most of the all the communicable diseases and as i said the field based special investigation form is there most of the uh, uh, data is there it's a very good uh, survey tool actually so we see what is happening and uh, we get all the data and uh, even the sources of contamination so you, possible source paddy field like that we get and again as i said for our surveillance purpose we have surveillance case definitions for each communicable uh, notifiable disease uh, lepto dengue so you don't need just to say it's lab confirmed if you suspect lepto nobody is going to penalize you for notifying in fact we are grateful all are grateful of course there will be some la, la, you know there are as in any other when you get increased number of patients 
it's even even in the curative sector there will be problems so likewise as i said when you get increased number of notification with the low resources there's going to be a problem but whatever it is your duty it is legally binding that you should uh, notify a suspected case of leptospirosis so with with actually uh, the history of exposure or occupation you can suspect and you can and not when you that when you actually any disease any communicable disease you will notify on suspicion on admission not on discharge so it will take two or three days to initiate uh, investigation so it will be a full blown outbreak if you uh, delay the notification and again as i said it is and a confirmed case is a lab confirmed case which is very rare to find nowadays so uh, you don't need to wait for the lab confirmation and at the active uh, field uh, level what the phi does is he obtains a relevant information whether it is left or not from the medical records verifies the diagnosis there's a part where he has to verify the diagnosis and ensure that the patient is taking proper treatment and encourage continued treatment and assess the health of if there are other people who has gone to the same paddy field say working in the same environment we have to assist them and uh, some people know the some they like even the phis know this paddy field is at risk for leptospirosis and we do the health education regarding leptospirosis and to take other control measures uh, and if there are like other people if they have not taken prophylaxis to give them prophylaxis and then report the findings again when we talk about deaths deaths are preventable sometimes it's not but if we have the proper resources if we diagnose and treat promptly deaths are preventable and all suspected deaths should be investigated so like the maternal mortality uh, mortality reviews there should be reviews for dengue and leptospirosis and it is the responsibility of the hospital director or the ms to ensure that this uh, institutional review is held and to find out the causes and to confirm the death as leptospirosis so again as i said it is a problem due, during these uh, covid times and now with the economic issues but we have to start those activities otherwise uh, we have already done some activities otherwise it's a problem for for the future and at the national level what we do uh, other than the supervision uh, we are trying to strengthen the ec surveillance activities as you know we rely on the printed material we still take the h544 dengue which has a surveillance system electronic surveillance system we don't have but at the moment with the current uh, economic uh, situation uh, we don't know whether we will be able to do it in the electronic system because actually the to the electronic system should be like the ideal if the doctor the treating physician or the doctor enters the data at the time so you if the opd surveillance is initiated and if the opd recording system is there when during the admission itself if you admit and notify it, that will be held but it is not happening anywhere and there will be uh, uh, lack of resources so what we need to do is we have to continue with the same system please Uh, send the notifications so at least those numbers are there and we know what is happening if there is a shift in the epidemiological uh, features there are if there are other uh, aspects so we need to know that from there only we know because the phi won't go to, and find the leptospirosis patients if you don't notify we we are not aware the 
preventive health staff will not be aware if there is a patient unless the hospital notifies. So either during the outbreaks, so even do, uh, within the, this thing, we are like working on this, but very difficult at the moment. So our surveillance is very, very, you know, uh, still we are relying on the paper-based system, which is actually good at the, because even uh, we, we, we can see what is happening at least. And we analyze the, as I said, as I showed you, we analyze the district-wide data, even at the district level, they have to do that. And we have now identified the specific risk groups and working on the, this thing. And we conduct the investigations with the support of the regional epidemiologists and uh, if the institutional level at the hospitals, when they uh, arrange, we, uh, we actually uh, really encourage that and uh, attend the meetings. And uh, usually we aware the high risk groups such as farming during the Jala and Maha season through the media. Uh, so for the even for the last few years, we have done that very expensive, but some of them uh, have been doing that for years and we have to give the government funds for that. Uh, so nowadays we are using the social media as much as possible. And they, as a CSR, they, uh, the media is uh, supporting us by giving, uh, um, you know, interviews uh, and uh, other uh, talk, uh, inviting us for short talks at the uh, uh, Rupa Vahini and other uh, television channels. So they are supporting and we have printed IEC, uh, which we have not printed recently, but we have the uh, ones we st uh, started off in 2019-18, but we have them because we can't uh, waste money at the moment uh, for printing purposes due to fund resource uh, allocation. And uh, the, earlier we had a good intersectoral collaboration with the other agricultural officers. We need to reactivate that and monitor the availability of doxycycline at the national level so far for the preventive purposes, we have enough doxy stocks. And for the next year, we have been like, uh, we have requested to the Indian credit line for nearly 4 million uh, doses should be available uh, for the prophylaxis. So for the past few years, we have been giving doxy prophylaxis and uh, that's how maybe the, even uh, the leptospirosis cases may have been at a certain uh, level because of the prophylaxis. But even if we give the prophylaxis, some people just take it and they may not take. Due to the COVID issues and uh, the economic activities, those activities were hampered. So we are using, actually those days we were using the Karnar as we for, so, for those uh, uh, distribution purposes. Uh, we need to actually uh, restart that this year we started on that Yala, Mahasi, uh, sorry Yala season we started in some district so Maha season also now we have enough uh, stock so we will be doing but again as I said the most vulnerable will not be the uh, farmers who regularly have access to the doxycycline who knows the PHI and who knows there are like uh, the, the treatment available but the uh, new people who will be taking up agriculture because of the uh, food and other issues, economic issues. So they have to be uh, made aware through like mass media and other aspects to be very careful. They can't take because they will be doing the agriculture work throughout the year. So if you can't give them uh, doxycycline, they should be made aware that you have to tell the doctor that you had muddy exposure and the doctor has to take notice. So those are the way that we can, ways we can uh, control the outbreaks. And we have national guidelines, which needs to be revised. So uh, clinical guidelines. So most probably last year it was uh, planned, but due to the issues, COVID issues, it was postponed. This year also we have the funds, but Again, we are having problems because of the economic issues, but the clinicians, 
there are so many interested clinicians and those who are really uh, like uh, has studied the epidemiology, has studied the patterns and they are really aware and they are starting and they are very uh, concerned about the disease. So uh, we will be having a sort of a um, consultative me a series of consultative meetings later on and updating the national guidelines. At least this is available, the 2016 guidelines are available in the EpiDunit website. And there are circulars uh, related to epid uh, sorry, leptospirosis in the EpiDunit website. Um, diagnosis and again lab uh, diagnosis and uh, other uh, doxycycline prophylaxis and all that so you can refer them up and uh, thank you very much for giving me the platform uh, i'm sorry uh, i took up uh, more than one and a half hours uh, so i think i will finish off now uh, thank you very much tatsara and the other uh, team uh, for hosting this and um, if there are any questions I'll be happy to uh, discuss those. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much Dr. Tushan Labrera. So on behalf of uh, Society for Health Research and Innovation and uh, 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 GMOA, I would like to extend uh, our gratitude and appreciation to Dr. Tushani Dabrera, who is the consultant community physician at the Epidemiology Unit Colombo, and is also uh, the focal point of leptospirosis prevention and control program at the Ministry of Health, Sri Lanka, madam. So we have uh, quite a few questions already uh, in the question booth. So we will just uh, go through the uh, things like, uh, if, uh, as this is a question time for the webinar. So if you have any more questions, please type it in the uh, chat box and uh, arrange your settings accordingly as shown in the slide and if you have specific questions you can reach us on the email given in the slide so madam uh, moving on to the questions uh, that we have already received yes so uh, first of all um, uh, yeah we will be moving on to the question posted by dr shamin the sena ratna so he had initially asked uh, uh, do you take a uh, lip uh, as lepto, a case which has been notified on clinical suspicion without performing a confirmatory test. I think this was addressed at the latter part of your surveillance uh, in, in the uh, lecture, most probably this is posted a little uh, above, above. And then he had a, a, a follow-up question saying, uh, is there a way to notify patients who are managed as outpatients by general practitioners, madam? So it's over to you. Yes, actually, uh our notif uh, ordinance uh, under the quarantine ordinance the notification regulations are there anybody who is seeing a patient uh, with any gazetted uh, notifiable disease anybody who sees a patient can notify so the gp actually we encourage the gps to notify there are some gps who do that that's all communication and you can actually request the h544 from the moh and keep uh, some uh, uh, forms with you and you can send it to the uh, MOH office. So, so there are some people who do that and we really, really actually appreciate that. And um, even for any other disease, dengue, we appreciate. As I said, unfortunately, uh, what, what is lacking is from our end, the resources. So, most probably uh, in another a few months, we don't know whether we have enough uh, H544 uh, notification cards, but you can always call and inform the MOH or send a message. So it is actually uh, our, uh, the, from the preventive health uh, side, we actually um, welcome that. Uh, but act, uh, there are like, uh, uh, some uh, concerns because usually due to the 100 year old uh, practice because our unit system started in 1926 so the notifications started even before that we usually require 
not we actually the uh, public health staff they usually require written document for uh, to take that as a notifiable uh, disease uh, so it was very very difficult at the start to start the uh, dengue surveillance in the electronic system nobody was like very unhappy about the, uh, the fact that we get the notifications through the electronic system you know it's very difficult to change our uh, behaviors but ultimately now they are taking the e surveillance data so uh, it is very difficult for me to say that if you notify over the phone they will take it but actually we will be uh, targeting our preventive health staff on this uh, training programs we have already allocated the day, uh, like the funds and all so we will be talking about it in as a district uh, epidemiologist uh, when i was working i usually encourage the gps and i uh, gave actually 544 to all our private hospitals and the uh, gps who requested uh, the 544 so you can of course we welcome it's great thank you over to you Tatsara. Uh, thank you for that answer, madam. Uh, there's another question in chat. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Mohoid has asked, what is the place of acetromycin relaxin at the dose? It is uh, I think uh, it will be discussed in the uh, clinical presentation. So many antibiotics, uh, doxy, penicillin, acetromycin, uh, actually um, has an effect. So uh, that's why we get the underestimation. So most of the time, uh, the people will go to the GP and if GP prescribes an antibiotic, then uh, actually the patient will be okay. So uh, I'm not uh, talking about the clinical management. So you will get a, a good uh, clinical lecture in November who the, with the physician who has vast experience. So you can discuss that with him. But usually many antibiotics work on leptospirosis. Thank you. Uh, yes, madam. Thank you so much for that explanation, madam. And there's uh, one last uh, question posted by Dr. Dinushka Jayavir Bandara uh, asking, is there adequate scientific evidence to show that doxyprophylaxis is effective? Okay. Actually, uh, this was a problem for us as well. Uh, during 2012 and 11, those days, uh, it was not a uh, uh, choice. No, uh, like, you know, there was a widespread um, outbreak in Kurunagala. And uh, the doxyprophylaxis, it was like, uh, you know, in Sri Lanka, it was not given in a widespread manner. But then the epidemiology unit uh, actually uh, started the prophylaxis. Uh, drug treatment, but there are scientific evidence from other countries that it is protective. As I said, unfortunately, uh, we don't have enough scientific evidence to say whether it is effective or not, but there are some clinical trials which says it is effective. In Sri Lanka, we have not done anything, but I think um, uh, we have the, uh, because it is an antibiotic, so we need to conduct more research. And uh, in, there are places where you get the, uh, there are countries that they give prophylaxis. Even, as I said, this is again a neglected part uh, of a neglected disease. So we give actually prophylaxis, but we are not doing adequate research. So our, I think we have to, think of research as well in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Madam. Uh, that brings us to the end of the question, the session of this uh, valuable topic. So uh, a little uh, reminder to the participants uh, to find the link of the feedback uh, in the chat box and to answer the post assessment questions. And if you have any more questions, you could direct it to the email address which was shown above uh, in the previous slide. And finally, on behalf of uh, Shri and GMOA, once again, I would like to send my 
appreciation and gratitude to Dr. Tushani Dabrera, who was here with us for about one and a half hours duration, discussing the importance of pre uh, prevention and control of spirosis, which is a preventable disease, and emphasizing how important it is as a clinician or a, any doctor in Sri Lanka to have a basic understanding of this disease and what are the measures that we have to follow in order to um, eliminate or reduce the burden of disease in Sri Lanka. So thank you very much, madam. And uh, thank you all for the participants as well for joining with us and your time and uh, hoping you a uh, great uh, weekend and hoping that you will join with us once again and extending gratitude to the madam and hoping Dr. Shani Dabrera will join hands with us with Sri and GMOA once again for another session in the future. Uh, we would like to conclude this uh, CPD session on leptospirosis control and prevention. Thank you very much. Thank you.